beautiful downtown Milheim. In the smack dab center of the Keystone State, this is Lou Bryson with Seen Through a Glass, a podcast that's mostly about food and drink in central Pennsylvania. Welcome to episode 39, Hot Peppers. When we moved to central PA, my wife and I were given all kinds of advice. And some of it was silly, like warnings about crazed serial killers out in the boonies. Some of it was amusingly misinformed, like the folks who worried that we'd never have a bagel again, or seafood. One that kind of struck home, though, was that the food in Central PA was a bit bland. Well, you know, it didn't take too many ham pot pie church dinners and strikingly tame Kung Pao takeouts to convince us that, yeah, things generally do tend to walk on the mild side here. Mayonnaise, mild cheese, frustratingly soft bread, sweet pizza sauce, and well-done meat are all common encounters. Well, what if it is? If there's a tendency to milder foods here, it's a legitimate heritage thing. There are a lot of folks here whose heritage is in the UK or Ireland, plenty of German stock, Scandinavians, and Eastern Europeans. Those cultures don't tend towards spicy, fiery food. They find their culinary thrills in sauerkraut, Limburger cheese, smoked fish, and horseradish. But this is America, so there are folks here who hark back to hotter climates and hotter cuisines, and they're happy to share. And, you know, give the rest of us a chance, and we can learn all kinds of things. Hot sauce, hot peppers, hot wings, even hot cheese. If you want your capsaicin-fueled endorphin rush, you can find it in Central PA. You don't really even have to go looking. What is capsaicin? You might remember me talking about it before when I was talking about the pain alcohol causes to your taste buds, because capsaicin sets off the same pain response. It's present in large quantities in hot peppers. It's the reason we call them hot peppers. Because capsaicin causes a burning sensation when it comes in contact with skin or flesh. It is the active ingredient in pepper spray a weapon designed to cause so much pain that an attacker will be deterred from aggression or any coordinated behavior at all, really. But here's the weird thing. Some of us like it. We actively seek it out and have bred peppers that have ever higher levels of it. You know what else is weird? Humans are the only mammals who will willingly eat these food that cause irritation, discomfort, and even pain in other mammals. Birds, on the other hand, are not affected by capsaicin. They don't have the chemical pathways in their cells, so they happily munch away. But we are affected. And not only do we enjoy these little pain crucibles, we enjoy them in different ways. Raw, right off the vine, cored out and stuffed with other foods, and then baked, or smoked, or fried, or pickled. We like them dried and powdered as a spice. We like them chopped up with tomatoes and tomatillos as salsa. We like them cooked and pureed and fermented as crazy varieties of hot sauce with even crazier names. And here in central PA, we particularly like them sliced up and preserved with vinegar, oil, garlic, and maybe a little bit of sugar so we can put them on everything we eat. Well, maybe not donuts. I'll tell you about the hot stuff you can find here in Central PA, and we'll talk with two people who can light up your lips with it. It's also been a while since I cooked for you, so I'm going to tell you how I finally solved a 45-year-old cooking question that's been bugging me. And we'll get to all that. But first, here's what I'm drinking today. What I'm drinking today is Shy Bear Brewing's Smoke Show, a smoked Baltic porter. Let me explain. First, Baltic Porter. You're probably familiar with Porter, the dark ale. It's one of the original beers of the craft beer movement, or one of the last holdovers from pre-prohibition, if you're a fan of Yingling Porter. Porters are usually dark ales, and there's a whole story of where Porter came from, but we're talking about Baltic Porter, and that, oddly, is more like Yingling Porter, because it's not an ale, it's brewed as a lager. Baltic porters survived in Eastern Europe and Scandinavia around the Baltic Sea. They were local copies of the big porters and stouts that British brewers exported to the Russian Imperial Court, the type of beer we now know as Russian Imperial Stout. It's my theory that these beers survived in Poland and Estonia and Latvia and Russia 
largely because of the economic policies of the Soviet Union. You make this beer, yes, comrade Brewer? So, you will continue to make this beer. Is now in five-year plan. Maybe. So while the rest of Europe became more and more pilsnerfied, these beers survived, and we came to know them as Baltic porters. Now, the smoked part is actually pretty simple. Like a jalapeno becoming a chipotle, brewers simply take malt and smoke it over a smoldering wood fire, often beech or alder wood. They then brew with that malt in a varying percentage, and the beer tastes smoky, like good barbecue or smoked salmon. Shy Bear's Smoke Show is made with 40% smoked malt. I had some last weekend, and I liked it so much that I got a four-pack and brought it home. Here it is. Let's crack it open. Smoke Show is, um, wow, uh, almost opaque. It's, it's brown, has a little reddish tinge to it. It's got just a light cap of foam. It is 8.3%, so, mm, and there it is. That smokiness right on the top. It's not... It's not blazing out of here, but you smell it as soon as you would get within a couple inches of the beer. Let's take a taste. Mm. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Not heavy, but authoritative. Oh, wow. Ah, the finish is... Okay, let me start from the beginning. There's very much malt. There's there's not a lot of hop here. This is a, a malted beer... And a smoky beer. So when you get it in your mouth, the first thing you taste is the smoke. It's not overwhelming. It's not ashy. It's like a, like a richness, almost like uh, more like smoked sausage than, don't think of smoke like smoke from a fire. This is more like smoke from eating smoked food. Bacon. Mm. You get the smoke and then it immediately spreads out and you get this rich, malty flavor that still has smoke in it. And everything comes together. And this beer never lays on your tongue. It's, it doesn't dance on your tongue like some people. Oh, it dances on the tongue. This beer stands on your tongue and is present. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a good presence. It's a solid presence. And I'll tell you, you're not really feeling the 8.3%, which is always a uh, a scary good thing. This is a four-pack of 16-ounce 8.3% beers for $20. Bought at the source and tasting delicious. And I feel like that's, for a change, getting my money's worth on a $20 four-pack. This, uh, this is an excellent beer. So now, before we get all heated up with the peppers, it's once again time for a smack dab in the center, sponsored by the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau. True confessions continue here on Scene Through a Glass. Back in March, I admitted that this beer and whiskey guy <gasps> likes a good glass of wine. Well, I'm back again to tell you that Kathy and I sometimes like to get our cider on. Two episodes ago, I talked about what a great time I'd had at Titan Hollow in Axeman sampling their ciders at their intensely decorated bar. The ciders are great, spanning quite a range, including a boldly spiced ginger cider that would kind of fit into this week's hot, 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 hot theme. There's also music, great food, and an outdoor area by the rushing waters of the Logan Branch. But I haven't told you about our visits to the 814 Cider Works out the Shingletown Road. We love it out there. It's smack dab in the midst of the JNL Farm Orchards, you can dig some live music, grab a bite from our favorite food trucks like Barbecue by Clem. And the cider's great because you can get a nice semi-dry cider and your friends can jump on a glass of something sweet and fruity. Sippin' Cider in the center of Center County. Come help us enjoy it all. So let's talk about why Central PA is not exactly the burning center of hot pepper culture. The hottest peppers grow in hot climates, which may explain why many cultures in these climates use these spicy ingredients in their cooking. It's also possible that spicy foods help control foodborne illnesses. You see, hot peppers have antibacterial properties, so maybe people in hotter climates where the peppers are hotter and food tends to go bad a little quicker learn to like the burn because it meant that the meat was safer 
We don't really know. Now, as I told you, we have two interviews with hot food producers, and as it happens, they're both women. The first is a small producer, someone I know here in Milheim, Beth Cower. Beth owns the Milheim Hotel and has also opened a store chock full of local crafts and food in Ehrensburg, the Old Village Mercantile. That's where she sells her hot peppers, under the Backyard Flavors label. I sat down and talked with her last week. Hey, I'm here with Beth Cower at Old Village Mercantile in Ehrensburg, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're making a line of... of what condiments, flavor products? What, what backyard flavors? Is backyard it? flavors. Yes. Okay, and how did you choose what you make on those? Well, I, to be honest with you, the um, company had already been in existence, but it was under oh. a different name. Okay, and they were looking for somebody to take over, and they chose me to take over, and that's just something I really enjoy doing is creating different things for people okay yeah. all right and you make a what is it a jarred peppers yes i do jarred hot peppers okay um i also do a um mustards uh -huh. and i do a horseradish mustard i do a deli mustard a beer mustard a habanero mustard Ooh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. And we also jar hot sauces at Milheim Hotel. I, I'm also owner of that, too. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Why make hot stuff? People enjoy hot stuff. Okay. Um, and it's something I enjoy, but it's it's just something people really enjoy. It's the flavor, I think, is, yeah. is what everybody likes. You know, I mean, we moved here fairly recently, and one thing people keep telling me is that people in central Pennsylvania don't like hot stuff. They don't like spices. They don't like... This has not been my experience. No, no. Ah. People like hot stuff. Yes. Yeah, they're a little nuts about it. Um, I think it's probably almost like black and white. Some people really, really like them, and other people just like, nope, no, 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 no. Exactly. Which exactly. is pretty much the way it is other places. Yeah. I, I think, think. I, I, I don't think, you know, we're any we're different. different. No. No. <laughs> no. no. Um, so you're making this stuff yourself? Yes. Okay. Yes. What what makes your hot peppers different? I grow the peppers myself. Okay. In my own garden. And from experience, I've had people tell me comparing my peppers to other people's peppers, you know, when you put other people's peppers in the refrigerator, how they gel. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mine do not. Okay. Mine have the same texture that they have from the minute they were opened. Okay. Yes. Okay. And they're they're hot. Uh -huh. but... <laughs> okay. All right. Fair but enough. From from customer experience, I've had some <laughs> feedback on it. I appreciate that warning. <laughs> working with peppers, I and I, I know I've had some painful experience working with fresh peppers. You have any? Um, I don't know what safety tips for working with peppers. Very well ventilated area. Okay. Um, I would suggest a fan. I sometimes even wear a face mask really? to work with okay. them. And definitely gloves. Gloves. Definitely yeah. gloves. <laughs> yeah, because you want to take them off when you're done. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. But you definitely need ventilation. Okay. Yes. Okay. I um, I know I found that when I when I cook them particularly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was telling you about a uh, jalapeno and onion fry that we do. That gets that can get painful. Yes, yeah. it can. Yeah. Not only, so. you know, touching it, but your eyes, right. your respiration it, all yeah. gets affected. Yeah, I breathed it in pretty hard the first time I made it, and I didn't make that mistake again. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So these uh, products, where, can people get them other than at the Mercantile? Right now, I'm exclusive at the Mercantile. Okay. Yes. I have had Myers Dairy um, have some interest in possibly carrying some of my mustards, though. Okay. Okay. But that... We haven't gotten that far yet, but gotcha. it is in the talks. Okay. The Mercantile, the Mercantile's been open how long? Uh, I opened October 7th of wow. 2023. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I'm still brand new. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, wow, branching out like crazy. Any uh, fresh ideas on how to use the peppers? What do you use the peppers for? Um, different thing. I do my pepper jars, uh -huh. of course. No, oh, um, no, I mean those. Oh, oh yeah. use, how to use yeah, those. Yeah, like, okay. like if I bought a jar. You could use them in any way. I have people that like butter crackers 
with, oh, okay. with putting put them right on. on um, you could put them on burgers. I mean, you could put them on tacos. Anyway, okay. um, even on salads. People love oh, yeah. peppers on salads, too. Yeah, you can probably cook with it, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah toss, can... a, toss a handful in some sauce. and Exactly. Yeah. yeah. On top of your spaghetti, you know, anything yeah. like that. Yeah. They're great. I also take some um, different peppers, and I make my own fresh peppers, or dried peppers, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, like a sprinkle, like the red pepper flakes. Yeah, yeah. But I use habaneros and... Other things like that. Mm. So they last a very long time. Yeah, I bet they it do. doesn't take yeah. long to. <laughs> <laughs> Short shake. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> okay. I think that's all I've got. Uh, okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I suspect we'll be talking to you again. Okay. <laughs> all right. I bought a jar of Beth's peppers, and I think I'm going to have some with lunch tomorrow. Now, the heat of peppers is often given in Scoville units. The scale was developed in 1912 by American chemist Wilbur Scoville. His methodology was simple. Take hot pepper extracts and dilute them with sugar water until no heat was detectable by human testers. If a pepper required 100,000 parts of sugar water to one part extract to be undetectable, it was deemed to have 100,000 Scoville units. Well, you can see the problem almost immediately. It relies on extracts rather than actual peppers. The detectable level is largely subjective. It assumes that capsaicin is the only heat-producing compound in the pepper, which turns out not to be true, and it gets much less accurate at levels of a million parts dilution and above. So the Scoville scale has been adapted to modern technology. Now high-pressure liquid chromatography is used to detect capsaicin levels at parts per million, and measured accurately up to 16 million Scoville units. The heat depends on a variety of factors, and a big one is ripeness. A riper pepper is a hotter pepper. So, some examples. Jalapenos range from 2,500 to 8,000. Hungarian wax peppers are anywhere from 1,000 to 15,000. Serranos are between 10 and 23,000. Habaneros from 100,000 to 350,000. And the vaunted Carolina Reaper, from 1.5 million up to just over 2 million. Pepper spray can range up to 5 million Scoville units. Maybe don't want to spray that on your food. Meanwhile, on the Lou scale, jalapenos are fun. Serranos are a little scary. Habaneros, barely tolerable. If you're going hotter than habaneros, you can keep that stuff. Thank you very much. Now, Do peppers, hot chilies, degrade your sense of taste? I mean, I've heard people joke about having scar tissue on their tongues from hot sauce. I've made the same joke about cask-strength whiskey. But there's no actual scientific proof for that. Indeed, if anything, capsaicin stimulation increases flavor sensation as the heat recedes. There is a desensitization that occurs, and a higher level of capsaicin is required to get the same burn. If you eat hot chilies every day you remain desensitized. But if you don't, your tolerance will slowly decline. And like the progress from roller coasters to bungee jumping to parachuting, as we desensitize ourselves to one thrill, a more extreme one must then take its place, as evidenced by the eternal quest for an ever hotter pepper or mouth-melting hot sauce. Now, if you do go too far, you may have a burning need to soothe your flaming tongue. Many cures are offered, like water, tortillas and salt, milk, sugar, beer, lemon juice. But capsaicin binds to the receptors tenaciously and is hard to dislodge. Milk does have some provable effect, likely due to the protein casein, which has a detergent effect on capsaicin. It's no magic bullet, but it does significantly decrease the recovery time. I talked to our next guest, Janet Robinson, about some of these things. Janet has a lot more experience with hot peppers. She's been making pepper products under the Piper's Peck name since 1998. She grows peppers and tomatoes on the hill outside of Belfont and cooks them up into salsas, jellies, jarred peppers, dried peppers, and hot pepper fudge. Here's what we talked about. Hey, I'm here with uh, Janet Robinson of the Piper's Peck. Belfont? Mm-hmm. This is yep, Belfont? Yeah. Address, yeah, okay. 
Yeah, there's actually there's a batch of jelly cooking on the <laughs> stove right now. Which uh, we're sitting in the office. I'm looking out the back door. Well, office kitchen, and I'm looking out the back door at your pepper. Yeah. Nice view. What, Pepperfield? Grove? Yeah, I call it a Pepperfield. Okay, all right. Yep. Yeah. Um, you're in Belfont. Did you, did you grow up here? Are you from here? No. Uh, my, hus- my husband and I both grew up in Olean, New York. Oh, okay. Which is uh, western New York yeah, State. Yeah, well, my wife stuff. has family out near there. Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we both grew up there. Um, ended up coming here to Penn State when my husband came for his master's. Okay. And then uh, we stayed yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that happens too, right? <laughs> yep, yep, yeah, yeah. And that was in the early '80s. Okay. We've so been here since. Oh then. wow. Okay. And you grow the you grow your own peppers here. You also buy some locally. Is that correct? I buy the transplants. I don't have the greenhouse uh, okay. or the uh, expertise to do my own. Since I plant about like 1,400 peppers and 250 tomato plants, <laughs> so I don't want to make any mistakes <laughs> right. trying to grow the little seedlings. So I buy the transplants. And mostly I use uh, my own peppers, but if I run out of some particular thing, then I can buy local okay. for those two. All right. How many plants do you have in, did you say, 1,400? I have 1,400 pepper plants. That includes hot peppers and sweet peppers. Okay. And then 250 tomatoes. Okay. And um, we'll be planting them on the 25th of May. Okay. They're not in yet. And is that a... Is that a frost? That's not a frost thing. That's well, a, it is. I it mean, is? I, wow. I wait. To, I mean, around here, this. Uh, well, you are kind of up on the slope, yeah, aren't you? Yeah. Well, it's that. That doesn't seem to matter too much. Okay. Although down in the valley, down in Belfont proper, they do seem to get frost before we do. Really. But around here, the fifteenth of May is generally considered the last frost date. Okay. But uh, I, I wait till the, the end. Right. <laughs> I don't want to take any chances. Okay. Your site says you started uh, Piper's Peck in 1998. Uh, How did that come about? What were you doing before? Why did you decide on that? Well, I was a teacher before, mm-hmm. doing uh, elementary school teaching. Um, and then I decided to quit teaching to raise my kids. So I did that. And, and when it comes to the point where you ask your kids, okay, from on a scale of 0 to 10, how important is it that I'm here when you come home from school? And they say, zero. Ah! <laughs> then you know it's time wow. to do something. I guess so. <laughs> so the choice was, do I want to go back to teaching or do I want to do something else? Yeah. And uh, Tim had been talking to a restaurant owner in State College. Tim, Tim's your husband. Tim's my husband, uh-huh. yeah. And they said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had fresh hot peppers whenever we needed them? And so he came home and kind of floated that idea to me. And I said, okay, well, well yeah, let's try it. <laughs> Okay. Was that was that a thing you were interested in? Did you enjoy them or just I, a I really had not much experience with hot peppers at all okay. up to that point. <laughs> so it was a big learning curve for me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Tell us about the products. What 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 do you have? What do you make? Well, I make salsas and hot pepper jellies with the uh, hot stuff and mm-hmm. dried peppers. I also dry some of the peppers. Oh, okay. Um, and then I make fruit jams and jellies as well. But that's and some of the stuff I grow here, and some I buy other places okay. for the fruits. But I have uh, you know, six, I think, different salsas and about six, six different uh, pepper jellies, okay. which has kind of expanded over the years. Yeah, what, um, what kind of different pepper jellies are there? Are they the just a different blend, or yeah, it's the, the kind of the standard hot pepper jelly that most people know about is. Sweet peppers and a little bit of jalapeno. Okay. So that's what I started with. And then I said to myself one day, well, if you can do it with that pepper, why not another pepper? Sure. <laughs> so I, I do sweet pepper jelly, with this, which is just plain sweet peppers. Mm-hmm. And then the regular standard hot pepper jelly. And I also do a cayenne pepper jelly and habanero pepper jelly. Okay. And the best seller is my raspberry chipotle. Oh, <laughs> Which is which isn't really super hot or anything. Sure. It's just a nice little kick to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, which of those is the hotter, the cayenne or the habanero? The habanero. habanero. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. I um, I had a bad experience with uh, cayenne one time. I, <laughs> I was at a, a wedding reception and I thought the shaker for the corn was paprika. Oh no! <laughs> and I really dusted it on there. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of couldn't speak for three or four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I understand, and yeah. that's kind of funny because. Um, most people have a hot pepper story. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> you know, I made this mistake or that mistake. <laughs> I worked with hot peppers and then I touched my eye. Well, that, I, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you, so I will just ask now. Um, 
safety tips from when people are working with them in the kitchen? Yeah, um, whether you think you should or not, even with Hungarian wax, which are relatively mild, mm-hmm. those hot peppers go, wear gloves. Okay. Yeah, for sure, because you can't tell that, Ooh, yeah, you know, you that oil's see getting it, right? into your fingers and, until, you know, an hour later and all of a sudden your hands are burning. <laughs> <laughs> so wear gloves. Um, for the habaneros, I also wear a mask. Do you really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do. Like a respirator kind of? Mm, well, yeah, just the, the kind that, you know, we used to wear a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, just the uh, Okay. And, and is that um, keeping it out of your lungs or is that over your eyes it's, as well? It's mostly just the fumes. Okay. Because, you know, they can really be, and especially if you're cooking with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't necessarily wear a mask then because you can just kind of stay out of its way. Right. But when right. I'm cutting them up, which, you know, takes a while. Okay. You know, kind of that accumulation just yeah. can bother with some coughing and sneezing if I don't. <laughs> okay. Dried peppers. How do you dry them? Is that just like in the oven at really low heat or? I have a dehydrator. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like about a five shelf dehydrator. Okay. Yeah. You know, for most of them. And then I also make chipotle. Oh, which, right. Um, yeah. A lot of people think that's just another type of pepper. But chipotle is actually a jalapeno pepper that's fully ripened. So mm-hmm. it's turned red. Okay. And then it's smoked and dried. Nice. So I have a little uh, Weber smoker. Okay. And then once they're smoked, then I dry them. So I make chipotle as well. And do you do you, do you core them before you smoke them, or no. you smoke the whole thing and then? Yeah, do those whole. Okay. Some of the some of the ones I dry, I chop first. Okay. Like, cayenne flakes. You know, you gotcha. Have them chopped and flaked, and then okay. I dry them once they're chopped. The dried peppers, they're whole or they're powdered or? Um, it's a combination. Okay. I do different things to different ones. Okay. Yeah. And is it true what we've been told about the, the hot part is the seeds and the webs or? Yep. The seeds really in, is. That, in okay. that uh, vein that the seeds are attached yeah. to. Yep. That's the hottest part. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, while I'm asking, I might as well, <laughs> since, <laughs> since you seem to, you, you ought to know what you're talking about. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, well, there's always that. <laughs> I have a smoker. I, I smoke things. And one of the things that you make is the smoked jalapenos that are stuffed with whatever. Mm-hmm. And they said, if it's too hot, soak it in Sprite overnight. Have you heard of this? I have never heard that okay. one before. <laughs> All right. I have not I have not gotten to trying it yet because I haven't, I guess I haven't smoked peppers often enough that I've, but that's on my list of things to try. Interesting. I don't yeah. know scientifically what that would do yeah, to I don't it. Know. But, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But. <laughs> Okay, worth a try. Put yeah, it hard, I guess. sure. You also have fudge. Mm-hmm. That seems to be the odd man out. How did it that come It is kind out? of the odd man okay. out. And the, the reason I started it is because I thought, oh, yeah, chocolate chipotle fudge. Oh, sure. So I make okay. chocolate fudge with chipotle powder in it. But then I said, well, you know, if I'm going to make fudge, I'll just make fudge. <laughs> and so I, I have uh, eight different types of fudge. Oh, wow, okay. Eight different flavors, you know, peanut butter, chocolate peanut butter, dark chocolate, you know. But so. you do still make the chipotle too, and I do make the chipotle okay. too. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, you also make uh, sandwich peppers, and I have to be honest, I don't remember seeing that until I came to Central Pennsylvania. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's just the concept of okay, so you're eating a uh, sausage sandwich or something, and a lot of times, you know, they'll cook up the, the peppers and right. things you put on it. You can put the sandwich peppers on it instead. Okay. Um, and basically, the way I do it, it's with vinegar. Sure. This, this is the brine you put them in: mm-hmm. vinegar, sugar, a little bit of oil, and salt. Okay. And then you just you know. And then it's a mix then, of hot and sweet, or I, yeah, I have three different ones. I do just Hungarian wax, which okay. are the more mild ones, uh-huh. and that's kind of like what you would get on a hoagie. Okay. If you ask for uh, banana peppers on a hoagie, right. that's what that's you get. Hungarian. That's wax. the same okay. thing. Um, straight jalapeno, and just you know in circles, you know, mm-hmm. these little slices. And then uh, mixed ones, okay. which would be a little hotter. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. The ones, I, <laughs> and this was a, a thing I saw. I, we used to live down outside of Philadelphia, the Italian long hots. Oh, yeah. Which yeah, yeah. are so random. You know, you'll get one and it's like a green pepper and you'll get another and you're, you know, wiping out your mouth with oh. a paper towel. <laughs> okay. It's, that, it's that's wild. Interesting. Yeah. I can never... And, and again, like you said about your your finger, you can't tell by looking at them. No, right. They all look the same. Right, right. It's just some of them are on fire. So. Yeah, there's another pepper that's that's traditionally like that, the shishudo pepper. Oh, really? Um, and they're they're really tiny. They're yeah. small. Yeah, I've um, had them. I've never had a, and, a screaming hot one though. No, and it's they say like one in ten oh, Lord. <laughs> is hot. 
I don't know why. Or, yeah. But it seems that that's just, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. I am a little bit surprised you don't make an actual hot sauce. Why is that? Well, it's probably because I've never had... I don't use hot sauces oh, myself. Oh, okay. Um, and so it's just never something I really was into. And okay. So, and it's a whole different process. It's kind of the same reason I don't write about gin. Okay. Just not interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, All let right. someone else do the sauces. And sure. And I'll do the sauces. And, oh, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll be honest, I hadn't thought of that as a reason. It's a really yeah, that's, reasonable that's one. that's pretty much the way it is. Okay. I mean, I make what I like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, that's how I decide what to make. And uh, so that just wasn't something that was in my okay. repertoire. So. Cool. Where, where can people get the products? Is it mail order, farm markets, all that? Yep, all that. Okay. Um, basically, I try to be as local as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm at the Downtown State College Farmer's Market on Fridays. Um, that's on Locust Lane in State College. And I do the Bullsburg Farmer's Market, which is at, on Tuesdays mm -hmm. from 2 to 6 in the uh, parking lot of the uh, Pennsylvania Military Museum. I do those two. I have some things in some of the stores around. Okay. Like Tate Farm Foods carries some. Um, let's see. Where else? Now that I've blanked out. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, in Belfont, there's Bell Mercantile, okay. a relatively new store in Belfont. They carry it. Uh, Flower Basket carries some in Belfont. Um, the Cheese Shop in State College oh, okay. um, carries some of the jellies. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm sure I forgot a couple. But there's, you know, some of the little special, specialty shops around okay. carry the products. And right. if, I mean, I'd say people can come out here. If I'm home, I'm open. Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. So, <laughs> ah. um, and I do a few of the local shows around. I do People's Choice Festival. Okay. So I'm there. And people can get stuff there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, Belfont has an Arts and Crafts Festival. And and they first. can order it online yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. And what's what's the website? It's, it's just, just piperspeck.com. Okay. Yeah. Easy enough. Yep. So, going back a little bit, I kind of get ahead of myself because of the kitchen tips thing. Say 50 years ago, because i that's when I was just starting to get interested in food. Uh, salsa was just going mainstream. When people said peppers, they meant red or green bell peppers. Dry peppers, there was chili powder. Hot sauce was Tabasco, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. Now there's a huge variety. Yeah, there uh, is. I mean, yeah. it's like a cult thing. I, I'm i not a pepperhead, but I've got... I think like four different dried peppers in my cabinet and I've got a couple few hot sauce. What happened? Yeah, I don't, it's very interesting because when I first started, I basically had to tell people all about this <laughs> stuff and you yeah. know, and educate them on you know hot stuff. And I didn't grow up eating hot stuff myself either. Uh -huh. um, but we had some friends from Arizona and they moved uh -huh. up here and they would bring gallons <laughs> of salsa yeah. with them. And so I eventually, you know, started to like it and learned to like it and started eating hotter and hotter things. And, and uh, it's just, and I think that might be what happened to people around because there's, you know, people, so yeah. much, uh, you know, interaction between states and, you know, countries and Yeah, <laughs> different you're not just things. eating it's the just, stuff you uh, grew up with no, anymore. right. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's something like that and people just gradually decided they liked it. And it seems like the younger generation is just... You know, it's, they eat it to begin with, and yeah, and they're fine with it. And, and then they're so off and running. I, yeah, and I've definitely seen a switch uh -huh. over the past. The, I've, this is my twenty sixth year then, and I've definitely seen a difference from when I started to now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is there a is there a is there a way to grow hotter peppers? Is there a thing you do to? You're nodding. Go ahead. Yeah, Run actually, the the drier and hotter oh, the climate, okay. the hotter the pepper will be. So, yes, you can grow hot peppers in Pennsylvania, but they won't be as hot as in <laughs> Texas or Arizona or whatever. Okay. But, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's basically, that's, you know. Kind that's of what's going to do it. Yeah. And, there, you know, there's always a range. And, uh -huh. Yeah. But, yeah, the hotter, the drier. Yeah. More, and I don't think this really falls into safety tips. This is just eating tips. Is there a real surefire way to, to soothe the burn? Uh, dairy Time. products. Oh, dairy products. Okay. Dairy products, yeah. Milk, like milk sour cream. Yeah. Ice cream. No. Oh, there's good. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but yeah, and, that's... And what's it, what's it doing? Well, because it's an oil. The, the capsation... Oh, um, is an oil. Is, is, yeah. And so it's just kind of... You, if you drink water, it doesn't... You know, water and oil don't mix, it. and it just... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, some for some reason, and I don't know all the scientific uh, 
Yeah, I'm digging into that and trying to figure it out, but yeah, but yeah. So it's it's basically milk products. Okay. Dairy products. Great. Yeah. Skull units. Um, how, how accurate is that? Because I looked at it and saw that it goes back to like I think 1914 or 1912, oh, and I have okay. a kind of tendency not to really put a lot of <laughs> bank in something that old anymore. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's the same process though. They would use this. I don't know how often they redo mm-hmm. any of this now that you're mentioning that. I don't know. But it's probably they use the same process to determine it. And there, there's always a range. Right. Um, and, you know, if you look at the little charts or something, there's always a, a range from how many scoville units each of the peppers is going to have. Uh-huh. But, uh, but yeah. in general, they do kind of sort into that. Yeah, and these are hot. These are hotter. These exactly, are, yeah. exactly, and they'll always stay there, no matter what the actual range within that uh-huh. is. But yeah, they'll always be uh, cayennes will always be hotter than a bell pepper. You know? Okay, yeah, okay. or always hotter than a jalapeno, for instance. Oh, it is definitely yeah. okay. All right, people talk about heat versus flavor, and I, I I learned a lot about that. Learned to drink whiskey. You have to get. Is there a kind of a a process? Do you get better at it? Well, I, I kind of developed mine because I tell people that I believe more in flavor than pain. Uh huh. Some people come to my stand and want something that's going to burn their face off. <laughs> but I have to disappoint them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I try to make something that you get the flavor first. Mm-hmm. That comes through first, and then you'll get some heat yeah. um, after that. So, yeah, I, I, most people, I think, like to eat the stuff for the flavor rather than the heat, and that's just an added bonus. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of that tingle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just discovered hot pepper jelly about ten years ago, and I, I, I um, it was actually at a, a place out in San Francisco that I went for breakfast, and they had jalapeno jelly with a, a fresh baked cornbread, and I, it was fabulous. Yeah. What, is that a relatively new thing, or have people been doing that for years and we just found out about it here in the East? I think we probably just found out about okay. it here in the East. I, I find people from all over different places, um, because I tried to track that down one time mm. to see you know, where it originated and uh-huh. where it was most used, but it seems to be everywhere. Okay. And that might be a year thing, too, you know, over the years. Oh, yeah. That more people are using it. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, once people try it, you know, from wherever they happen to be. And that's how I started making it. Uh-huh. It's because I tried it at a party. Okay. And said, oh, peppers? Okay. <laughs> I think I can do this. <laughs> and so I started making pepper jelly. And and I think now, I'd have to look up my records for sure, but I think I sell more pepper jelly than I sell salsa. Oh, wow. These days. Yeah. So well, okay. That's, that's an surprising. interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> Especially yeah, I mean, I just, I just emptied a jar. I have to get another jar because yeah, okay. I, I like having some in the fridge all the yeah. time. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. the habanero pepper jelly is pretty popular. Okay. The hotter one, yeah. Yeah. Since we we moved here uh, about five years ago, and since we moved here, I keep hearing people joke about central Pennsylvania doesn't like spicy food. This has not been my experience. Has, have things changed? It depends on Just where a... you are in, Pennsylvania, in okay. central Pennsylvania. Okay. Because <laughs> central Pennsylvania is, is so interesting because you've got all kinds of different uh, areas of, you know, different pockets of different people. And, um, you know, you've got all kinds of different uh, uh, ethnic groups and whatnot. And you've got the university. And so that's, you know, a oh, combination yeah. of all kinds of things. And then you've got Pennsylvania Dutch food. And, it, it, you know, it's such a cool combination here in central Pennsylvania, but um, I find a lot of people, and I, I used to try to try to uh, figure when someone comes by my booth, okay, or you know, just by looking at them, okay, are they going to like hot stuff or not? And it totally surprises you. It doesn't really. You, you cannot, you cannot <laughs> determine <laughs> just by looking at someone or trying yeah, to figure yeah. out. You know, it seems like yeah. And if they don't, maybe it's a thing they grew up with, or if they, uh-huh. or they tried it and decided they don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm like it's again. It's like whiskey. One bad experience will really put you off it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what um, What are your favorite peppers? Well, the favorite one I like to cook with is poblanos. Oh, nice. Okay, um, and they're they're a relatively mild. Yeah, pepper. A lot of flavor. And, uh, yes, a lot of flavor, and I like to stuff those with like rice and yeah. cheese and that kind of thing. Yeah, we've. Um, I don't know 
where they're getting them, but uh, um, our local supermarket has been getting some really nice ones in. Oh. And we've been uh, we've been enjoying that. Oh wow! Really? Yeah, my uh, my wife's always been a big uh, Chiliano fan. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and she's finally figured out how to make them at home. So yep, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah they are cool. very good. That's that's my favorite one. Yeah, yeah, which little just a little heat. Yep. Right. Yeah. And like you say, lots of flavor. Yeah. yeah. And then I like the dried cayennes. Okay. As you can know. Put them in all kinds of things. And and <laughs> when, and when you have a whole dried pepper, what do you do with it? Well, you can uh, soak it in some sort of liquid. Okay, and um, then just slice it. And, and then, yeah, slice it and chop it up or whatever. Or just put it like a little slit in it. Mm-hmm. Put it in your super stew, stew, and then take it out. Oh, I mean, I never even thought of that. I mean, okay. so, so if someone wants to chomp on it, they could. Sure, but, you know, sure. You but you get the flavor and then... almost like a bay leaf. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That idea. Huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, this is <laughs> honestly, this is why I started this podcast. I wanted to learn stuff. So, yeah. you yeah, know, if other cool. people come along, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, that's a neat little thing. I think that's all I got. Did I forget anything? Is anything? I don't think so. Yeah. No, I think that's pretty good. I'm just going to uh, wrap it up here and then go enjoy this day. Yes. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Thanks. It's the same. <laughs> Now, I was going to have this be an episode about all kinds of hot foods, like wings and hot sauces and curries and maybe hot cinnamon candy. But the whole sandwich pepper story was more than enough. There's always next time. I was also a little disappointed that I was unable to find a central PA producer of horseradish, because that's the hot stuff that really twists this Dutchman's tonsils. If you know of someone selling freshly made horseradish in the seen-through-a-glass region, please let me know. I definitely want to talk to them. I'm going to leave you with this little story about the effects of hot foods. Over the years, I've progressed from eating nachos that were essentially hot Velveeta on corn chips to piling on the fresh or pickled jalapenos and lashing into it. So when I was at a beer festival a while back and wound up at dinner with some Australian brewers, I suggested we get a plate of the house nachos, peppers and all. The head brewer balked. Nachos? Nah, mate, I can't eat those. Give me the Johnny Cash. What? Johnny Cash? Ah, the ring of fire! (laughs) Another great day for international relations. Hey, you know, we haven't done any cooking in months, and I just made a great little one-pot dinner, so I'm going to share that with you. When I was in college, my roommate, Dave Knoll, was from D.C. Like most people in D.C., he wasn't a native. His father worked for the State Department. I think Dave was actually born in Lebanon. Anyway, I went to visit him one summer, and I still remember that his mother, who worked as a speechwriter for a senator, they were a very D.C. family, made dinner of sausage and lentils. I was very familiar with sausage, of course, but I'd never had lentils before. I thought the whole thing was delicious. But, you know, I wasn't really cooking at the time, so I didn't think to ask for a recipe. I really wish I had, because I've been chasing that recipe ever since. I thought I had something that was close, and I put it in our family cookbook. I wrote a family cookbook back in 2014 with recipes from both sides of our families, plus a few friends, and self-published it. It surprised me how well it came out, although I'm still finding a few errors, like ingredients that never get added in the instructions, and some glaring omissions like chicken pot pie and potato salad. Kathy's family and my family both have good, but quite different, potato salad traditions. No, neither of them have raisins, thank you very much. And somehow, I forgot both of them. There are four different recipes for baked lima beans, though. (laughs) Anyway, I had this recipe that I thought was good. But recently, I found myself with a pound and a half of the very, very good smoked sausage that Penns Valley Meat Market makes right here in Milheim, and I was thinking about a sausage and bean soup. So I hit up Google and searched smoked sausage and beans to see what came up. And one of the recipes that came up was from food.com, lentils with smoked sausage and carrots. Carrots! I never thought to add carrots And I suddenly realized that, yes, what Peggy Nall had served me all those years ago did have carrots. I had to try this. Otherwise, it was pretty close to what I already had, except my recipe didn't use smoked sausage, probably because the smoked sausage I was using 10 years ago was Hillshire Farm smoked turkey sausage, which, eh, kind of utilitarian. 
Now that I had a seriously smoky and richly spiced smoked sausage, it was clear that this was the way. Oh, there was one other difference. My recipe had oregano because, well, I tend to use a lot of oregano. This recipe had thyme. Now, I like thyme, but I'd never thought to use it in a dish like this. And I just happened to have some sprigs of fresh thyme from another recipe. Kathy's always saying that beans are a flavor sink in recipes, so I doubled the thyme and bay leaves and boosted the flavor of the chicken broth with an extra teaspoon of better-than-bullion paste. I started chopping carrots into inch-long, thin slices, and then coarsely chopped up a large white onion. I got them going in a Dutch oven with three cloves of minced garlic and a knob of good butter. I later added a good glug of Spanish olive oil and sliced the sausage into thin discs. Pippin liked that part. Anytime I sliced too thin and the disc fell apart, he got some. When the onions were translucent and the carrots had started to soften, I added a pound and a quarter of rinsed lentils, the sausage, and about a quart and a half of chicken stock. Then I stirred in two thyme twigs, about four inches long, and two bay leaves, and a teaspoon of salt. I brought that to a boil, then covered it, and knocked it back to simmer, and left it for an hour. No stirring, no checking. Dinner time. We fell to with a glass of Penfold's Canunga Hill Cab Shiraz Red Blend, a favorite Aussie table bottle. It was very good. The smoked sausage came through richly, the thyme added its hillside magic, and the carrots made for a depth and just a little touch of sweetness that I have to think Peggy would have approved of. You know, today I went back to it for lunch, and I had to try something. I added a can of diced plum tomatoes I got at Delalo's two weeks ago. That was good, too. And you know, the next time, I would make this either way, depending on the mood. It's good stuff, and finally getting this right after over 40 years was quite satisfying. A quick report on my basement bar. It's done. Well, the draft system isn't in yet, but the woodwork, the paint, the lights, the stove, the stonework is all done. Our contractor, Matt Garman, did a fantastic job capturing the look I had in mind. A rural Western Ireland pub. We looked at pictures. He even sat and watched a video with me to get what I had in mind. And then he went and did it. There's just the sink in the bathroom to go yet. They're supposed to get that later this week. The glassware is ready to go. Cocktail equipment is in place. Bar towels and mats, coasters. The wall decorations are down there. I just need to actually put them up. The playlist for opening night is compiled. I've got the propane stove remote finally figured out. Now I need the beer. Last weekend, I had some friends over to plan the draft system, and it got a bit technical. At one point, we were actually talking about a small glycol reservoir with an aquarium pump in the freezer of the keg fridge to keep the draft lines cold. But I decided to go with the more mundane cold air recirculation system. We're going to have two taps, one for beer, one for seltzer, or the occasional draft cocktail. What beer? Well, that's the question of the month, isn't it? I'll tell you one thing that's for certain. It's going to be a beer from Central PA. Guaranteed. That's the show. Thanks to Janet Robinson and Beth Cower for taking the time to talk peppers. And my thanks to Rich Gallup, Dave Dries, and Tim Yarrington for helping put in the draft system. And a salute to Dave Nall, my late college roommate who died just before the vaccines arrived. I wish we could have had one last adventure. As always, you can see those episode-related pics on Instagram at Stag Podcast and on Facebook at Seen Through a Glass. If you're listening to the show on the radio at WSOV, there are over 30 more episodes to enjoy, including a Milheim episode and a Nittany Valley episode on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or, like I listen, directly on the Podbean app. If you'd like to toss a bit in my hat to keep the show going, I have a coffee button in my Instagram link tree, that's at Stag Podcast, and at the Facebook page. Coffee, it's K-O-F-I, is an easy way to drop me a few bucks online to help keep this going. If you've already donated, thank you. Now, I've told you about Pennsylvania's state bird, the ruffed grouse, and the state animal, the white-tailed deer. Our state amphibian. Did you know only 28 states have an official amphibian? Oh, and and Puerto Rico as well. Our state amphibian is the Eastern Hellbender, the largest salamander in the East. 
It's also known unofficially as a lasagna lizard, devil dog, mud devil, Allegheny alligator, and my favorite, a snot otter. The next episode, it's going to be outside of central PA, but only by a little. I'm heading up to Northeast Pennsylvania, where my old buddy Chip the Beer Guy has been working with five craft breweries to pull off something a little magical. You'll get that, plus a visit to a true OG beer bar and a classic kielbasa shop in two weeks. Until then, thanks for listening. This is Lou Bryson on Seen Through a Glass from the smack dab center of the Keystone State. Mm-hmm.